Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you now with Dr. Ronen. Um, we'll talk about some really interesting aspects of AI, and we're going to introduce also a new concept, which we've been working on for a while, which is called AI for AI. So please, Ronen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I'm delighted to be here because the field of uh, combining AI with medicine for health, for better health, uh, has been, you know, my obsession for uh, maybe the past decade or so. Um, I have, my original experience with that was in academia where I did my PhD uh, designing an AI system that can predict treatment outcome on a personalized level. Uh, so we worked mainly with complex diseases, infectious diseases like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, many others. Um, where um, patients were given cocktail of drugs and we were able to predict what would be the outcome one year ahead after only one month and then also in a different version. After one week of therapy, we could predict what would be the end result a year later. And that had, of course, tremendous uh, effect on therapy uh, and the ability, of course, when you see that the what the future holds for you is not as good, we can still change it <laughs> and uh, tune uh, and optimize the therapy for each individual. Um, and then uh, I, I think uh, me and my other colleagues were um, some of the first entrepreneurs uh, to try to make something in the industry uh, that combines AI and health. Um, so we had uh, several uh, attempts, um, and some of them were successful. Um, and uh, eventually, we understood we understood that after doing many different AI projects, each was separated. Um, the new wave of AI would be actually to do the one AI to rule them all, if you will. Okay, uh, and this is the AI for AI which is uh, uh, really uh, replacing not only the, let's say, the physician the, or the radiologist or whatever, but also replace the data scientist, the machine learning engineer that actually builds the AI to replace the radiologist, whatever it is. Okay, so um, this is uh, where we are aiming right now because the impact of such um, space is, is uh, enormous. Interesting, Ronan. Um, as, as you know, I've been on, on this journey on cloud AI also for, for a decade now. And um, one of the areas that really fascinated me, not, not so much on the, uh, on the technicalities, but, uh, but on, the, on the principles around AI, was the fact that uh, we as human beings are, are biased. And uh, we, we, in a way, we may propagate the bias into our artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So, uh, I think that uh, AI for AI as, as a new concept has a, an extreme power also in addressing that kind of issue. I wonder if you could share a little bit about you know, the issue of bias in AI and, and how AI for AI can help that. Sure, so bias in AI is of course something uh, that we all face and uh, uh, doing AI from, from start. You know, if you put different, two different data scientists probably the systems will be different and then results will be different and maybe the conclusions and then the actions uh, being performed on, on patients will be different just because it was uh, <laughs> done uh, with a different team or, or different uh, data scientists. Uh, and therefore, um, when we talk about AI for AI, we talk about a more um, standardized and a more optimized um, uh, manner to do that. Um, I think one of the best examples for that is a, a field called uh, evolutionary computation. Um, evolutionary computation, we all know uh, in general that AI tries to simulate the brain, right? Um, and the neural networks and deep learning are the best examples of this kind of simulation of the neurons in our head uh, and the brain and the thought processes. Fantastic, that's great. But you know, intelligence in nature is not only in the brain. There are other natural processes that are intelligent. And um, I think everyone agrees that uh, the best, the number one uh, um, example of that is the process of 
evolution from the Darwinian point of view, natural selection. Um, and uh, the idea is that with this phase of computing we call the evolutionary computing, um, we simulate evolution, but not of organs, but of computer code. We simulate the evolution that can improve automatically the code that produces the AI, okay? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, this is exactly what happened to us, right? Our minds, our brains, they can think, they can learn, okay? I can now learn a new language, that's for sure. But the ability to learn a new language or whatever skill I want to learn now is built, is based upon billions of years of evolution. So now we not only simulate the brain itself, but we also simulate the process of evolution that he created the brain from the first place. Uh, and exactly this is um, um, something that quite surprisingly, I must say, uh, we found not only us um, to be best done with, by simulating the exact mechanisms of genetic evolution. The same thing, you know, that happens to our DNA with um, the, you know, first of all, the fact that each one, each uh, individual holds half of his, of his genetic material from his father and half uh, of the genetic material of his mother, right? And it's just a random combination. At some point, you know, in, in most cases, um, the offspring is more or less an average between the father and the mother. In some cases, he has bad luck and he gets the bad characteristics from the father with the bad characteristics for the mother. But at some chance, maybe even very, very small chance, is we find the combination of just the good characteristics of the father with the good characteristics of the mother. Like happened to me, for example. Now, this is a very low chance, right? <laughs> but, but the good thing about computers is that we can have a very large population, virtual populations of such individuals, of computer codes, each one is like a different small AI or machine learning code. And then we run them generation after generation after generation. In uh, computers, we don't need to wait billions of years. We can just do it uh, with a few, you know, a few minutes or, or hours or days. If you know. And then for sure, you know, that that slight chance of the good combinations of the characteristics from the, both parents will emerge. And they actually, um, the creatures, the AI brains that we evolve uh, are actually the aggregation of all the good combinations of genes and all the good random mutations uh, that we encounter. Um, and the end result is, is really superior. I, I fully agree, uh, Ronan. Uh, I was uh, reading a comment uh, this morning from uh, Professor Adam Grant from, from Wharton School, and I, I loved his, uh, his uh, insights. And uh, he was just uh, making a very simple yet profound comment on how people tend to share articles and, um, and uh, content that they truly believe in, because they kind of want to propagate uh, you know, their own beliefs. And that doesn't help uh, uh, them learn. So yeah. sometimes if, if we share an article, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that's on there. It might be that it has some different perspectives that I might not personally agree with, but I want to share because I want to get other perspectives, and that's part of the learning. So I think what you said relates a, a lot to that concept in my mind because you know artificial intelligence can be as good as you know what what, what we know. Is, yes. <laughs> we don't know what we don't know, and, right. and and I think AI for AI is just a great mechanism for making sure that we're constantly learning. And uh, and on that note, I, I think you would expect that because you've known me for a while now. I, I would love to ask you to, to share a, a visual demonstration of, of how it works. So, okay, yes. Uh, there's uh, like the classic uh, example of that that they teach at schools, at universities. Um, the challenge here is to draw the Mona Lisa just uh, using very a small number of circles. Each circle can be anywhere on the canvas, in any radius, uh, any color, and any opacity. Okay, so they can be on one on top of the other and then the colors get uh, mixed. Um, let me show you, please. So what you see here at the right side of the screen, you see like 
um, 25 small circle, uh, small uh, uh, squares. Um, they are like, uh, this is the population of solutions. This solution is again the Mona Lisa, uh, just drawing it with circles. Um, and uh, on the left side, you see a, like a zoom in of the best individual in each uh, uh, generation. Now the generation uh, go a few, few generations in a second, uh, every second. And uh, what you see here is that um, the algorithms of course has the original Mona Lisa where it compares uh, the pixels uh, just one by one uh, to that original one. And we try, this is like the evolutionary force that tries to change the DNA of the Mona Lisa, which is just uh, where each, um, it dictates where each circle should be in each color, in what color. Um, so it becomes more and more and more um, similar to the original one. You know, Darwin said, uh, it's not like uh, the strongest one survives, uh, it's the fittest one produces more offspring. This is what we simulate here. Better Mona Lisas will um, um, actually mate, and the offspring will have the characteristics of both its parents. And this is uh, how eventually we got to a very, very good uh, approximation of Mona Lisa with just 250 circles in a combination that, you know, even Leonardo da Vinci himself could not have done. And this is exactly what we do here with the AI for AI, because um, just imagine that each circle is not a circle. It's a machine learning algorithm. And they work together, they like build together a much higher level technology with many pipelines of machine learning algorithms in different variants with different parameters, never mind. Um, but together, to really receive a, an optimized um, architecture and an optimized product that is um, better designed than whatever uh, Leonardo da Vinci version of a data scientist uh, could have done manually. So uh, this is the uh, power of, of what we do. Amazing. Um, it was great. Uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Ronen. I think it's a great visualization. And uh, on, on that note, um, you know, um, I grew up in a house of uh, physicians and I've, I've always struggled with the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, there are many uh, solutions for, for different problems and they change over time. We live in very, uh, very hectic times with uh, COVID-19 and lots of things happening in the world. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, this concept of AI for AI you've been working on for a while. Um, how does that really apply to health in general? Oh, uh, it has the most uh, important connections to health. Um, let me explain. Um, in health, I think everyone can agree we have two big challenges when we try to apply AI. One is the challenge of data, and the second is the challenge of people. Regarding data, the data in medicine is, in general, very complex. Uh, suffers from inherent no uh, problems like noise and sparseness, uh, Bias says anything that we measure, most of the things that we measure are just a proxy of the actual biochemical uh, process that is happening and that underlies all the uh, phenomena, the physiological phenomena that the patient uh, can uh, have. And um, that means, you know, if you compare it to other machine learning and AI systems that need to predict, you know, uh, stock rates or whatever, here, the data is much, <laughs> much more problematic. So that is one problem. The second problem is the problem of people. Um, I can say, you know, I've been fortunate enough uh, in Israel. Israel is quite a leader in the field of AI and medicine and uh, medical data altogether. Um, so the, the university that I work for uh, have uh, has joined forces with the uh, Sheba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in Israel, to create a program, a study program, for physicians to teach them AI or to teach them machine learning and other data uh, sciences like genomics and other stuff that are more relevant even um, for medicine. Uh, and then, although this experience was amazing, and now, the, by the way, the, uh, this program becomes an online uh, program on edX 
So if anyone is interested, uh, you can go on edX, write just biomedical informatics and you'll see our course. Uh, anyhow, we understood, and that was a very, very important realization, that in any domain or in any application of AI, you need to have a person or, or a group of people that know AI and know something about the domain. Okay, so if it's you know um, autonomous driving, I'm sure most of the AI engineers drove a car, so they know about driving. However, when you apply artificial intelligence in medicine, this is not the case. Uh, most AI engineers they have like zero knowledge in medicine, and that's you know it's something that we can all uh, understand. Now we have, so we have great. Uh, machine learning engineers, they know nothing about medicine. We have great physicians who know nothing about AI, but you really need a brain that knows the two languages in order to make a breakthrough, to connect a medical problem with just the right technology. Uh, this is what in our program we try to cultivate and we build this cadre of uh, futuristic uh, um, physicians and researchers. Um, so that's good, of course. This is not scalable, maybe, but, but that's good from the educational point of view. Now, AI for AI solves the two problems. When you have such a problematic data like you have in AI, you need a stronger, as that you have in medicine, sorry, you need a stronger AI um, uh, mechanism. You know, there's like a very easy to understand the trade off between the uh, quality of your data uh, and uh, the quality of the algorithms. If you have, you know, very large data sets of, uh, of like training sets of, of data uh, that are clean, that are, uh, they don't have noise, they don't have the sparseness issues, that's great. So you can use a quite average or classic AI technology. On the other hand, uh, in uh, medicine, as I said before, the data is problematic, therefore you need a much stronger mm -hmm. AI technology. This is one. The second thing, of course, that um, because we cannot expect uh, all physicians to know AI and not all AI engineers or large enough even number of AI engineers to know about medicine, we need to help them with this kind of technology that can do some parts of their work uh, by itself. And let me give another uh, example. We worked uh, on a project, a very interesting project, um, actually with the, the Israeli military. Um, and you know, in Israel, everyone needs to go to the uh, army, unfortunately, and uh, people get uh, injured or killed at war, in war. And it appeared that the number one cause of death for soldiers in combat is a pneumothorax. This is where your lungs collapse because you had like a bullet uh, that penetrates uh, your chest um, and the wound. So you have blood going inside or even just air going inside and it like pushes away the lung. All right. Now, in, in theory, what, when something like this happens, you need a doctor to, has, to have his stethoscope in a quiet room and to like, uh, listen to you breathing uh, and then identifying exactly what kind of pneumothorax it is, what, what is the severity. And then, of course, this is not possible uh, at combat zones, and it is, but it is very needed in combat zones because in some cases you can say to the soldier, you know what, you can go, go ahead, fight. On some cases you say, oh, just sit, sit here, relax. In some cases, you'll call in a helicopter to come and take him to the hospital. So uh, this is very important. Now, uh, so the Israeli military um, developed this gadget, okay? So four stethoscopes that a soldier can put on himself or on a friend's chest. And it listens to the soldier breathing for 12 seconds. And then uh, the AI needs to actually replace that uh, physician and decide on the diagnosis and the prognosis and the therapy and so on. So um, that was very hard. 
because first of all, as I, as I said before, there was the number, the size of the data was uh, small. Well, luckily enough, we don't have so many injured uh, soldiers. <laughs> Uh, and secondly, uh, because uh, there was a lot of noise and even, even you know, in the war zones and so on, um, and they tried to do it with classic UI, AI. They even had one of the most prestigious universities in the world trying to solve this problem, um, but it couldn't. So when we got the project and uh, applied our AI for AI thing, it made like changes, I can uh, explain more and talk about it for hours, but, but really it changed things that in general I can say no one would have ever encountered to think about, not only to apply, but it tested like um, billions of combinations of algorithms and variants and parameters that eventually changed the way um, the algorithm, it like it learned to simulate a synthetic data set where uh, the, the classic AI algorithm was um, um, like a run against in order to, to encounter one of the biggest problems in AI in general, which is the problem of overfitting. Okay, so you can say that the AI for AI learned by itself how to overcome the problem of overfitting when, when everybody faces when you have small data sets, noisy data sets, and so on. So we overcame that huge obstacle and we were able to increase um, the accuracy level of to around 91% if you compare it to experienced human um, physician that is doing it in a very quiet room. So that was uh, amazing and we are still trying to push it even further. Thank you for sharing the story, Ren. I personally uh, feel very connected to that. I'm, uh, I'm lucky that uh, in Brazil, the, the, my military service only lasted a week <laughs> and, uh, and it was only about push-ups, but uh, I, I really appreciate the, the fact that, uh, you know, my, my main passion and interest in, in in the health space is literally we can save uh, lives of millions of not, uh, billions of people and uh, I think what you're doing has a lot of impact there. Um, I wonder if you can share you know any additional thoughts as you said this is a fascinating field that I personally um, empathize and, 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 and it intrigues me a lot uh, but for the sake of time and we have probably over a thousand uh, health professionals uh, listening right now um, you know the, the, the whole concept of, of evolution um, has also been evolving uh, quite a lot. So would you mind to share maybe some, some um, final thoughts in terms of what's next? Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, um, this field evolving, the impact in, in health and any other trends uh, that you see that, uh, that could be relevant for, for people out there? Yes, I think uh, the next thing just around the corner uh, is evolving not just the AI, but also evolving medical hypothesis. Um, if you think about the process of scientific discoveries in general, a person, a scientist comes up with a hypothesis, a certain hypothesis that, that he has, and then he needs to articulate some uh, scientific questions, and then to draw some experiments, and then to measure the results and create data. And then with the data, it does some statistics or whatever in order to validate um, um, the, the, hypo the initial hypothesis. Now, in each step along this funnel, you know, you become, it, it is more problematic because you can articulate a hypothesis that is very clean, that is very uh, beautiful, but when you've done the experiments and the other data, you suffer from noise, you suffer from some biases, whatever, it's more problematic. Now, the new paradigm is actually to take this pyramid uh, upside down and to begin with the data without the hypothesis. Why can we just begin with the data? Because we have it. We have data. You know, nowadays, uh, uh, electronic medical records uh, have given us, you know, abundancy of, uh, of patients' history, 
uh, that uh, it's a gold mine that we can really haven't even, we haven't really even touched the surface. Um, also, you think about genomic data, right? What used uh, the, the first human uh, uh, genome it was a project that took, uh, I think, what, 15 years or something that now we can do it in five minutes. Uh, so, really, we have abundance of data. We can just begin with the data. And now, let the computer evolve hypothesis in the same way that uh, genetic mechanisms evolve people, <laughs> or, or flowers, or fungi, or whatever. And then, of course, we can run the needed, the required statistics to validate each hypothesis or not, but the idea is that uh, we can let the computer discover the things that we could not even uh, think about in uh, sci-fi, right? <laughs> uh, and again, this is, um, especially needed when you have uh, a shortage of people who know the two disciplines of uh, AI and medicine. In this case, we even need much further uh, those kind of virtual hypothesis engines. And this is exactly what AI for AI is uh, good for. That's uh, super interesting, Ronen. Uh, as you say, I think a lot of the uh, challenges uh, in terms of evolving hypothesis, and we see many different industries. Uh, I, I had a stint at uh, strategy consulting, and we, you know, a long time ago, we we had to have make hypotheses. You know, kind of there was a book written in uh, McKinsey uh, uh, style, which is uh, answers first. It took me a while to understand what answers first mean, but it was sort of I had to have a hypothesis and then get the data and get there. So there is there's a merit to the process, but as you say, you know, it's it's a very uh, time-consuming one and very prone to errors. Um, I've seen actually some AI startups um, work with uh, strategy consulting firms to kind of try and shift that paradigm and, and come up with hypotheses that nobody yeah. would, would normally think about exactly. and, and test that. I, I think it's a fascinating concept. And uh, as I said, you know, um, I appreciate in, in medicine not only the sensitivity of the data and, and, the, and the impact that you have in people's lives combined with so many variables, you know, it's, I think it's humanly possible to run so many models you know, only in, within uh, someone's brain. So right. that's incredibly powerful. Um, I, I really enjoyed our conversation as always. Um, I really wanted to thank you for, for coming and, and joining us. And uh, I wish you continued success in the journey. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I, re I think uh, we can all agree that we can be quite optimistic about the future of health. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs>